here again. It is Atlantic Discourse. My name remains Ade Balogo. I'm your host and moderator. Some of you call me old, some of you call me moderator. So I added the two together. In the past, I said good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what part of the globe or the planet you are from. But like my Australian friend to say, just say good day. That suffices for everything. So good day, everybody. Good day to the seven continents of the world. Good day, Antarctica. Good day, Australia. Good day, Africa. Good day, Europe. Good day, North America, good day, South America. Today, Friday, we're back again with another very scintillating topic. I've never hidden my flair for Nigeria because I was born in Nigeria. Nigeria, as I've always said, is the largest concentration of black people on the planet. There are statistics that show that one out of every four sub Saharan African is a Nigerian. There are statistics that clearly show that one out of every six black persons in the whole world is a Nigerian. That's why we always have emphasis on Nigeria. We just finished a, a, a ten-part series. This is the final part of that ten-part series. We wanted to do a five-part, but due to popular demand, we had to expand it. We started with Professor Chris Mwa Kobia. You know, we talked about state of the nation, what, what was really happening. We spoke to Jumo Keaki Taylor. We talked about the moral fiber of the nation, how the decadence came about. We spoke to Mazi. Is it okay the role about the role in JJ Media, the role of the media in nation building? We spoke to young, fantastic investigative journalist Fisai Oshiriombo on about law enforcement. We, well, we had Professor Akin Oshitoku, who wrote, spoke about role of opposition in, in politics in Nigeria. We spoke to Laya Miko Eke about the about general agitation, is of the Dua People's Movement. We spoke to Samuel Adeus on migration. We spoke to Professor Chidi Aslem Odinkalu about nepotism and the rot in the judiciary. Just last week, we spoke to Professor uh, Pat Utomi. And the topic was what the future holds. But this time around, we're getting more intrinsic and tactical with empirical details coming from another erudite scholar. That's why the topic for the final episode of the Tempest series is redefining the future, a tactical approach to nature building. There's no other person to call for this kind of uh, topic. Somebody who has slayed stereotype also, is he cuts across all, almost all the barriers of the Nigerian uh, society. He's been in showbiz, acting, award-winning actor for that matter. He is a lawyer, you know, a, a great one at that. And he's also a politician that's working for the Labour Party. And he has been very true to power, which is the major reason we're bringing him here. Not because of his affiliation. He says it the way it is. And he's erudite, like I said, which fits the billion of Atlanta discourse all the time. Today, we have Kenneth Okonko in the house. Mr. Okonko, welcome to Atlanta Discuss. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, like you said, I want to wish everybody watching from any part of the world a happy day and thank you for joining in. All right. So in our tradition, you know, we just don't like to waste time. We just go for the juggler. What we do here, we just go for the facts. You know, we try and bridge the gap between developing and the developed world. You know, we disseminate positive news in a world filled with bad news. Yeah, positive news in this regard just means the fact. So, Mr. Okonko, how did Nigeria get into this mess? Recently, we saw Tanzania had overgenerated electricity, excess electricity, that they had to turn off some hydropower station and some turbines. The, the whole of Daisalam, Dodoma, Arusha, even from aerial view, is all lightning, you know? I mean, why, why are we still grappling with that? You know, just recently again, we saw Nigeria has dropped to the fourth largest economy in Africa. That's just unbelievable because I remember on that Jonathan, Jonathan that everybody even abused. Nigeria was was said to even be one of the, the second fastest econo development economy in the world. How did it get to fourth? That fourth is not just being fourth. We're, we're grappling with Togo, you know, Togo that we just look at as the 37th state of Nigeria and with Benin Republic as the 39th, I think. You know, and we can't even organize the elections properly. 400 billion naira down the drain. That is excluding money that came from European Union and America. India is, is, is voting, you know, soon. 1.2 billion people. And I'm sure within 24 hours, we see the results in India. Senegal, just our Ecuador brother, they voted recently, you know, and it was just free, fair, and 
the winner was announced and the nation is at peace. How did Nigeria get into this moral decadence? Over to you, sir. Well, it has been settled worldwide that Nigeria is a blessed country with abundant human and natural resources. You have just rightly pointed out that Nigeria has the largest concentration of black people on earth, the largest economy, and the most populous nation in Africa. You do not have all these abundant resources in human beings and in natural resources. Oil flowing like a river in the south and has even been discovered in the north, Milk flowing like river in the north through our innumerable number of cattle. And then honey practically coming out from our land. Gold, lithium, bitumen. You don't have all these things and say you're not blessed. But if you have all these things and you lack one thing, then all these things will go down the drain. So we got here through incompetent and corrupt leadership, and then through inconsistencies in policies. In leadership, not only that we were inconsistent in policies, we were inconsistent in system of governance. We started with parliamentary, the military interrupted, we ended with presidential, the military interrupted, and then presidential again. Inconsistencies. You know, that brings me to the list of what the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria listed as part of the problems of Nigeria. And when you look at it, you would know that gradually these are the things that brought us here. They said, and they were talking to this present government, they said this government has a list of things that is making it to fall and continue to fall and making the manufacturing sector to go into comatose. One, frequent policy flip-flop. Two, high interest rate on loans. Three, hyperinflation. Four, astronomical energy costs. Five, Multiple charges. Six, toxic environmental space. In other words, the toxic operating space, the toxic mm. operating environment, etc. Let's start with that frequent policy somersault. This government came in. I've already told you how we have been somersaulting from parliamentary to military. And as we were going, we were degenerating because each one comes with its own incompetence and corruption. Each one comes with the ability not to continue with what the other administration has established, whether it is good or bad. Remember one of Bassinger sold to the refinery, Yaradua, of the same part, we cancelled them. No, no good reason for that. If that policy had stood, by now we wouldn't have had problem with refined products. So I just gave you an example. What inconsistency from one government to do to the other government can do to us. But let's talk about the frequent policy flip-flop. And let's take this incumbent government, for example. You can see what is going on in our foreign exchange market. When this government came in, the official rate was about 500 naira to a dollar. And this government, in a bid to flow the naira so that you have the same exchange rate, dropped this value of naira to almost, it went to almost 2,000 naira per dollar. And then started appreciating it again to going to almost 1,000 naira to a dollar. And now it is rising again. So this is absolute macroeconomic volatility. Now, let me break it down for you in simple terms. A manufacturer that is doing business with 500,000 naira and is importing 500 units of products at 500 naira per unit. 
That means he pays 500,000 naira. Remember, most of our manufacturers depend on imported raw materials and a lot of things. So you, when you drop naira, pia in one, in one, you know, two, from 500 naira to 2,000 naira to a dollar. That manufacturer now needs 1.5 million naira extra to buy the same product mm. he was buying for 500,000 naira. Now, he needs to borrow 1.5 million naira from the bank with an interest rate of almost 35% per annum. Then he borrows it. Then he imports the same 500 units. And the cycle for a manufacturer lasts between 90 days to 180 days from the time he will place order, purchase, process the material, produce the goods, and sell. Now again, he now buys a 2,000 naira per dollar. The cost of his goods now is 2 million naira. Before he produces and sells, you have dropped the naira again to 1,000 naira per dollar. He has lost 1 million naira worth of his capital. So, the loan he has collected is owing 1.5 million. Even if he sells all the products, even at this cost price, he will not realize his capital. He will now have only 1 million naira. How is he going to pay back the other 1 million naira from the bank? He cannot. He becomes insolvent and the business dies. So they, that's why the Manufacturing Association of Nigeria told this government that 40% of the manufacturing plants will go down if they don't change their policies. And you know what? In the past one year, about a thousand companies have gone down in Nigeria. And within APC's government, from 2015 to now, we've had more than 100 national grid collapse. So the energy is collapsing every second. As I'm talking to you now, we don't have light. Yesterday alone, they brought light for more than 20 times and took it for more than 20 times. So you can see inconsistency, fluctuation, flip-flop in everything. And you would have known that the energy cost has now been threefold. Where are they going to get the money? You would have known that today, people are lining up to buy fuel at that cost of purportedly fuel subsidy is gone. And I can tell you that the first subsidy that they said is gone, they are paying almost 1 trillion naira every month for subsidy. And the reason is simple. When you decree the first subsidy out of existence, and then everything is imported because you are not refining anything. And then you depreciate Naira from 500 to 2000. There is no way you will be able to import that refined product at that same price. So they threw away subsidy, but they are paying subsidy now for about trillion, one trillion naira every month in order to be able to buy, to keep the price at that high price. So you cannot afford the energy cost. You cannot afford the forex volatility. You cannot afford food. The food inflation is 40.1%. And this is just book work. Otherwise, if you tell me, I will say it's gone up to more than 200%. Because the rice we used to buy 25,000. When this regime came in, we were buying about 80 something thousand. So, how much increase? That's about 300% increase. So, in America, when there is inflation from 3.5% to 5%, everybody will be saying this government must go. In Nigeria, <laughs> inflation is 40 something percent. <laughs> and this government shamelessly is not going. So, there is nothing that is sustaining this country. When this government came in, since it came in to now, it has borrowed almost $15 billion. And it's still borrowing. The last one is almost like two days ago. $2.5 billion from the World Bank. And they have a moratorium of 10 years so that this government would have finished and run away. So they've already started accumulating debt for the next generation. Now, when they come to, you know, bamboozle you, hey, it's 1%, hey, this and that, 
that particular money, you will pay it back, even if it is interest-free. So what are you doing with it? Let me tell you what they're doing with it. They are sharing money amongst their ministers in the name of palliatives. Because the best palliative you would have given to Nigeria is to sustain the subsidy until you repair our refineries, until you can supply the products at a very, at a very good rate. So they say they are doing palliatives and they are sharing billions to their ministers. The palliative is not even reaching the people. You would have heard that the government suspended the program. Not because they wanted to suspend it, but because it, yeah, it has been blown open. Otherwise, they would have shared all the billions among themselves. Now, that is about what they do with the money. Let me tell you what else they do with the money. Travel around the world, purporting to be searching for investments. Are you searching for investment for a country that the security level is zero? People are being killed in the North Central by marauders. In Plateau, they've been killing people every day. In Niger, they've been killing people, killing officers and men every day. In the Southwest, you must have heard how the Yoruba nation agitators went in and nearly overthrew a state capital, killing people. Same in the South-South, same in the Southeast. Same in the Northeast, you heard, of course, you know about the Boko Haram that has not ended. The Northwest, you heard about the kidnappers, the terrorists, the kidnapping children in hundreds of, 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 of the students. And you're going outside campaigning that you should come and invest in your country. No, they know they will not come to invest. They just want the head, you know, expenditure head to share the money. Now, another thing, they know they will not come. They know. How many have come since they have been launching it? You will take 1,000, more than 1,000 persons abroad for one country. And then yeah. you will finish all those things. And they say they are coming. Of course, that's what they will say. Let me tell you, more than 200 companies have left Nigeria in the recent past. All the known companies, you know, foreign companies, they have left. And then you cannot even secure the one you have. And you're pretending that you're going out to preach to people to come in. No energy, no forex, no security, and you're saying you are campaigning to come. They are using those ones to perish the little dollar that we have. Let me tell you another thing that is eating the dollars. You may have heard that this government awarded a contract purported Lagos to Calabar Express Road for 15 trillion naira. A government that the internal road networks are all dilapidated. And then a government that does not have money. You are practically financing even the one you have with borrowed funds. Then you are awarding one contract to a foreigner to a foreign company at 15 trillion naira, Lagos Calabar Express Road. That is about 15, 15 point something billion dollars. They know that it's a white elephant project, but they're finding a way to perish the dollars. The one they borrowed, though, not the one we have. So not only that the money is not there, the money will not be there because they are already preparing ground to swallow the little that they have borrowed. So we are now owing excess money, which they are finding it difficult to finance. I mean, financing the interest. Our revenue now may not be able to finance our interest. And then you are awarding such contracts, which you know will add nothing to the economy. Because if they are borrowed, the interest rate on it, you will not be able to realize by people using that route. Then what is the intelligence in your... Okay, the budget of this year was about 27 trillion naira. They borrowed about 10 trillion naira to finance the budget of this year. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about budget of the whole nation. Now, you cannot finance the budget of 27 trillion and you are awarding one contract one contract for 15 trillion 
So you can see the level of incompetence. You can see the level of corruption. You can see the level of inconsistency. That is why we are where we are today. And it's like each government that comes begins to be worse than the one that was before. How? Like I keep saying, I was thinking why this government will be the worst that we ever will have. In nine months going to one year, this government has completely surpassed it. I am not aware that Buhari awarded one contract that is worth 15 point something trillion. I am not aware of it. And I am not aware that Buhari in one year almost is going to borrow almost $17 billion. So you can imagine whatever Buhari has done, this government is actually topping on it. Yeah. So my brother, that's why how we came here and unfortunately, it's not getting any better with this regime. Yeah, uh, you know, here at Atlanta, discuss, it's a discussion. So we too, we have ideas on some of these things. And I'll talk about that uh, lagos Calabar Road. And what beats our imagination is that there's a contract for East-West Road already. There's a uh, uh, East-West uh, rail line also. And uh, they're not funding those two. You know, and you're not funding... Oh. You know, what the, without even tender of bidding, I think I think that's just, uh, it's not, it's just not acceptable. And and you know why? Mm. Because Calabar is going to pass through the cities of the mm. largest landowners in Nigeria. The Lagos Axis. Remember, they started stealing Lagos land in plots. And then, they gradually graduated they will start stealing it in estates. And they gradually graduated to start stealing it in islands. And they have now graduated to start stealing it in cities. So they need a road to pass through that place. Why would Lagos, Calabar, start from Lagos? Lagos that is already saturated and almost built up. Why wouldn't it start from Calabar? They just want to provide road for the cities that they have stolen. Everything about this administration is for personal and pecuniary reasons. And you can quote me on that. Yeah. Because yeah. if you I mean, through this, you have seen mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, Even the why? East West Rail Line 2 is there. But it's not funded. Why is it not funded? Mm. funded? Okay, let's go to, you know, one of the reasons why we decided to invite is that you always come up with solutions also. You don't just talk, you come up with solutions, ideas, and all that. And that's why you are our guest for this third and final episode. So what I want to sure. ask is this, I want to go to solution proper. But before we go to the question, you know, while I was researching for this episode, you know, I was reading about nation building, you know, because the topic is redefining the future tactical approach to nation building. So there was a definition I stumbled on. It said, Nation building, this is the intervention in the affairs of a nation for the purpose of changing the state method of government. You know, nation building also includes effort to promote institutions which will provide for economic well-being and social equity. You know, so I'm sure you agree with that. So my question yeah, is, take it, take what would be your own tactical approach? So, yeah, take, take your own tactical approach. Mm -hmm. your, take that definition your own again. Tactic... I should what? Take that definition again. The first oh, okay. sentence. Okay. Nation building. This is the intervention in the affairs of a nation for the purpose of changing the state method of government. Okay. Second one, second paragraph. Nation building yeah. also includes effort to promote institutions which will provide for economic well being and social equity. Absolutely. Okay, agree. So my question to you is, what would be your tactical approach to nation building from, from considering the current state of affairs? How do you think we should approach it? Should, for example, we have ethnic agitation, should everybody go their way? Should have the sovereign national conference? Should, I, I think it's already concluded that there's failure of leadership. Should we, should the people rise up? Should, I don't know. You, that's why you're here, you're the expert. So what do you think? What's the tactical approach to bring Nigeria out of this morass? Good. Ironically, the solution to Nigerian problem is very easy. Very easy. Because 
you have the men, you have the materials, you have the money. So what you simply need to do is to have competent men of capacity and character who knows how to plan, who know how to plan, to organize, to direct, to control these men, materials, and money to produce the desired goods and services so that the nation's objectives will be achieved. Now, why I say it's very easy is let's start with security because the primary purpose of government is security. And once there's no security, no other thing can fall into shape. This government came in and had the greatest opportunity because the man personally chose the people of the National Assembly. And when he wants to choose, he always likes to choose very corrupt and compromised people so that they will know that if he does, if they don't do what he wants, they will go to EFCC threat. Some of them actually are EFCC, you know, uh, EFCC people that are owing. Yes, yeah, they have cases there already. Mm. Good. Whether you are the national chairman of APC or whether you are the chairman of the National Assembly, they are already, you know, uh, visitors to EFCC. So you already know that if he does the and you don't say, yes, sir, yes, sir, you go to jail. So he has the golden opportunity to even use all these things for the benefit of Nigeria. Why have this person that has been telling you about federalism, telling you about restructuring, why has he not ordered for state police? Now, when you're talking about security in Nigeria, I want to tell you the peculiarity of Nigeria. Nigeria is the last nation in West Africa and the first nation in Central Africa. Nigeria is surrounded completely by Francophone countries. Nigeria is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual, multicultural society. Nigeria has more than 200 million persons. There is no country in the whole world that has these characteristics that is manned by only one police. None. Why? It is impossible. So, it is impossible because somebody will just come from his own ethnic stock, move into another ethnic stock, carry all the insecurity, and run back to his own ethnic stock for cover. The same thing with religious stock. So, it is impossible because 300 and something thousand men or 400 and something thousand men cannot police up to 200 million persons. It is impossible because we have international challenge. You have rebels coming in from Cameroon to attack Nigeria. They may not be doing it because they want to take any territory. But when they are squeezed in their country and they need resources and they need money, they believe that entering into Nigeria and stealing those things will help them and they will invade Nigeria. You have people from the north. When Gaddafi failed, when he fell from power, then all those people now descended and became terrorists. They attack and invade Nigeria to cut away resources to kill people and to take over their land. Then you have people coming from the western Nigeria, all those small arms and ammunition, they come in through the porous borders of western Nigeria. So you see, all these security challenges cannot be handled by one police. So the, the first and foremost solution to that is to make sure that state police is allowed by our constitution, amend our constitution, grant these state governments the power to establish their own state police and use commensurate weapons to withstand these marauders. It is inevitable. This government is going to one year and it's just buying time. You know, dictators don't always like to share powers. Forget the optics, whatever they tell you. It's just, okay, the whole governors have come together to say, we need state police. And they had a meeting. And they agreed. You know what this government did? It went back to tell them to submit. Each governor should submit a memorandum. What do you need memorandum for? 
to buy time because they are not interested in doing it. They want to have absolute control over the police so that they can carry ballot box and do whatever they want to do. You need to guarantee and establish state police. And not only state police, community police. And imagine if every local woman, has, even if it is 50 men, what it means is that you cannot leave your ethnic stock to go into another person's ethnic, another ethnic stock to attack them and go back to your own. Because they will resist you. What is happening now in Bulatu? People from a, another ethnic stock will go and bring sophisticated weapons and attack these people, chase them away from their land and occupy their land. Now, if they have the sympathy of the people that are governing, they will turn the other way. Mm -hmm. What is happening in Niger State? Terrorists have taken over some local governments. The Niger governor just ordered that you should shoot on sight any terrorist, any person, because they are killing people and they are now collecting taxes. The police is not able to govern all the ungoverned spaces. But if there is state police, if there is local government police, which is community policing, there will be no space that will be ungoverned. Because the people in that place, they all know where these people are hiding. What they don't have is the weapons to go and confront them. And if you call the government, you will not see the government. So the first thing is to decentralize our police force. And I can tell you, all these youths that are looking for what to do, when you now give them the desired weapons, tell them the incentive of protecting their lands, they will protect their land. More than 165 farmers we are killed in March alone. March. How do you talk about food security? So it is inevitable any government that wants to succeed as a matter of urgency must establish state police. That was what Peter Bill did in Anambra State. He established community police. He established the vigilantes. He bought Hilux boxes and Hilux uh, 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 vehicles for all the communities. And you know what? They chased away all the criminals. Destroy their houses. Any kidnapper, his house will be demolished. That is why the Inspector General of Police said that throughout will be tenure that no one successful bank robbery succeeded. All the kidnappers, that was one Evans, the kidnapper, ran away to Lagos. He said obese security architecture drove him from Anambra State. So you see, these things work. They have been tried. And if any government in Nigeria tries it again, they will succeed. So that is about security. Establishing state security, establishing community policing, then the federal government will not stop there. They have to employ more hands. The men they have now is not enough, even with state police. You, you have the standard established by United Nations. We've not even reached that standard. And when United Nations talk, they talk about minimum. So the issue here is that they have been using the military to do what the police ought to have done. And you can see the number of casualties that we are taking from the military. We just lost 17 the other day. We just lost 6 the other day in Niger, 17 in Delta. These are men that cost us money to train and we're not even talking about other nations killing them. We're talking about dangerous criminals within Nigeria killing them. Can you imagine the Yoruba nation agitators? They killed people attacking the secretariat of a government. Ibadan is the capital of Southwest. What happened to intelligence? What happened to the federal police that they couldn't even hmm, detect these people beforehand and attack them? It's shameful. So, forget it. The only solution is state police, local government police. That's about security. Then, about economy. It is clear that you must shift emphasis from consumption to production. Everything this government has been doing has been anti-production. They must reverse the policy. 
if we assume that they have they taken care of the security because lack of security still affects production, no farmer will go too far. Good. The next thing is macroeconomic stability. It is not about Naira being high or low. It is about determining the correct price of Naira and being stable about it for a long time. Once there is volatility, you are killing the economy because uncertainty is the worst problem to productivity. So when we talk about the economy, please, astronomical energy cost must be reduced because people would have to have energy before they can do work. Energy is defined as the power to do work. Power is defined as the ability to do work. You don't have energy. You don't have power. When people don't have electricity, they ought to have cheap fuel, cheap diesel to run their own generator. There is no cheap diesel. There's no cheap electricity. So energy must be available. So you talk about security, the next thing is energy. And the cost of it must be cheap. People will relocate from Nigeria to Tanzania just because they have energy stability. Producers will go there and they will sleep. Remember, a Nigerian businessman can leave Nigeria, go to Tanzania, produce his goods at a very cheap rate and re-import it into Nigeria. That is dollars now that ought to be in Nigeria. So what I'm saying is security, energy, then interest rates on loans. And you know I listed these things. You must have to address it. No country will survive on 35% interest on loan. Because if you borrow 100 million in a year, eh, you're going to pay 135 million. Where are you going to get that money? If you put in the cost of other things that we have just mentioned, high energy cost, high interest loan. So the central bank must do something to bring the interest rate down. Then you talk about multiple charges. Will it, will it surprise you to know that anybody that is importing goods from our ports, before you leave your, the port there, and I'm talking about you have done everything right, before you leave your port to your warehouse, the area boys would have collected millions from you. These are illegal charges. Then we're talking about multiple charges where the government will want you to pay expatriate levy. They will want you to pay this tax. They will pay, you know, they just want any way to extort money from people. So multiple charges must be addressed. You don't try to stimulate your economy and you are punishing people. You know that in Nigeria now, they have band A, band B. You see the danger in monopoly. Somebody is consuming more of your product. That person deserves to be given discount. That person deserves a thank you card. But in Nigeria, for consuming more power, you are punished. Band A, band, you know, I don't know. It is simply senseless policies. But it's happening. Multiple charges. The government is trying to extort money from the people. People that are already dying. That is why they are using that money for themselves. So, when you talk about multiple charges, you talk about the environment people that are operating. Very hostile environment. I've told you security. I've told you good. Then, when you address these things, then we will get to a better level. That is when productivity can commence. And then there will be consistency in productivity. And then we have self-sufficiency locally and we can export. Then we earn dollars. Not borrowing dollars to suppress the depreciation of Naira. We will earn dollars. Our refineries should be repaired immediately. The greatest destroyer of our foreign exchange is imported fuel. And shame to all of us that we are producing oil 
one time sixth largest producer of oil on mm -hmm. earth and we cannot refine a liter of oil in our land and we have four refineries lying waste all the billions that have been allocated to them have been squandered by the people the leaders now when you do all these things then you have to safeguard them how fighting corruption corruption is the greatest thing that is affecting this country. When I was doing my banking class in the University of Nigeria, business administration, my professor of banking, whose first set of students had become professors when we came in, so he's a professor's professor, he taught us that there are five factors that will determine the credit worthiness of somebody. If I can remember, it's a capital, so capacity, it's a character, it's a economic condition, then uh, 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 the remaining thing, you know, character, capital, capacity, economic condition, it's collateral. Now, he told us that the excess of one of these factors can be ameliorated by the scarcity of another one. Meaning, mm. if you don't have capacity, capacity is your earning power, mm. <laughs> then capital is your established assets. So mm. if you don't have capacity, but you have excess capital, you can deal. Then he told us that there is one factor that the Scarcity of it cannot be filled with the excess of others. And he said that one is character. Mm. Because character is that attributes and threats in somebody that will make him to do the wrong thing, even when he has all the opportunities to do the right thing. A man that has no character will borrow from you and refuse to pay you back, even when he has the money. So he said, once you notice a man that doesn't have character, please run away from that person, even if he's the richest man on earth. So Nigeria has been governed by men that lack character. So even with the surplusness of all these resources we have, that is why we are not going forward. So we need to run away from these kleptomaniacs, from these thieves, from these irreparable robbers that are governing us and begin to look towards men of character. Because even if they see the right thing, which will not benefit them and their family, they will not go into it. If a governor, while leaving office, can dip his hand and take $720,000 to pay for the lifetime of the child, when the children of the people that voted him to power cannot even fight food to eat, then you can imagine the level of that deficiency in character. So what I am saying in effect is that corruption, which is the abuse of public power for private gain, is the worst thing that can happen to us. So we must have to fight it. I am scared about this government. Because I can see a discernible trajectory in their fight against corruption. It seems that political enemies are the ones that are targeted. And I have no problem with that. Because being a political enemy is not a defense for you to be corrupt. So I have no problem with that. But what it means is that if people can see that trajectory, what they simply need to do to avoid being tackled or punished is to become the friend of the government. I can see that all the people that have been arrested and tackled are people who either did not like this government before coming in or who have been vocally talking. They are corrupt though. I am not saying the government is wrong. I am saying that will not give us the clean country. 
Because what it means is that once somebody is your friend, whatever he does, he gets away with it. Let me give an example. I know of some ministers that we are accused that they took hundreds of millions in that humanitarian humanitarian mm -hmm. uh, first ministry. Nothing has been done against them. There is no prosecution. Good. Is it a Mefele? Is a Mefele the only person that worked in Central Bank? No. It is, it is obvious. I have nothing against his being prosecuted. I mean, he should. But is he the only person? He said he got approvals from all his bosses. Why single him out alone for that? Now, another example. Because this so-called, you know, corruption fight, like I said, is taking a discernible hand. So, assuming you even talk about the MFLA alone, just look at what happened. <laughs> it is good. And they should not only think about sending the people to jail. They have to try to collect as much money that they stole from them as possible. Let me tell you the truth. If somebody stole $2 billion from us and he said he can give us back our $2 billion and let him be given suspended jail term, I don't mind. Let us collect our $2 billion. Convict him that he's a criminal. Let him go and serve it in his house. So we just have to fight corruption and make sure that everybody, everybody who is corrupt is fought and thrown to jail. So this I'm government, mm. I have a fear. Why do I say I have a fear? Why did you have to choose people in the National Assembly to be the leaders when you know that EFCC, they are on the EFCC list? If Oluka Yode is serious, let him go to National Assembly and all the leaders that are there who said they were sick when they were invited in EF, to, to EFCC, let them be reinvited. They don't have immunity. Why would you choose a national chairman for your party that has a case to answer in EFCC? Oluka Yode should go and pick him up. Let all of them answer for their for their issues. Can you imagine Kano State they are telling you the governor there, 50 point something billion naira. And the governor is even going to court to say, no, it is EFCC that should try me. It is this, this and that. It's not state government. What is EFCC doing? So you see, I have a problem with the fight against corruption with this government. Because I'm beginning to see that they shield the people that are loyal to them and they are exposing only the political enemies so let me must... let me come in there yes sir. let me come in there i like those points you made at the fantastic point and i agree we agree at the editorial level with so many of those things but what i'm coming in now is this you know you said something about state police uh to this should it be state original you know like now we have six sub regions you know should and you also said community police should the police when you say state, should it be, let's say, for example, Southwest should have a police force, uh, South South has a police force, then the community police should be to the state or, or how does that work? The, the follow-up on that, which I will allow you to take the two at the same time, what will be your preferred system of government? There's a lot of views and cry now about the parliamentary system. Professor Tommy is supporting it. I think one of my other guests to mention it. It's and the excuse is that the parliamentary system is cheap. The prime minister or whoever is at the head of government is more accessible to the people. Then it's cheaper. All this go around the nations we're stealing money to do presidential campaign. So over to you, sir. All right. Now, let me just go straight into the system of government. Mm, okay. Right. Then after, we'll return to the other one. Police. State police. Yes. But if I may just um, run the state police issue, because it is just mm. um, an incidental question. Now, mm. you cannot have regional police force because your government is not 
designed on regional basis. Basis, okay. So, yeah. The police has to be under a command of a mm. chief security officer. So there is no regional chief security officer. So if you have a regional police force, who will he be reporting to? So you can only have state police because the federating units in Nigeria are the states. But the each geopolitical zone can work in unison. Remember when they wanted to form Amoteko? They wanted it to be a regional police. But then it was not possible because there will be no regional law. So mm -hmm. each state has to make its law because there's no regional law. Mm -hmm. So it has to be state police because the police will go in line with the structure of government that you have. So you have three tiers of government, the federal, the state, and the local government. Otherwise, they won't be under any structure of government to command them. So that's by the way. Then let's go into the system of government. I respectfully beg to disagree that the people that are saying parliamentary is cheaper. It is not true. It is cheaper where it is because even if it is presidential in that place, it will still be cheaper. America, their system of government is not costly for the people. If you had read about the House, the Congress members, some of them sleep in their office. That's very true. They are entitled to just their salary. No residential no. car, no residential quarters. Yeah. And you see how whenever any of them is corrupt, even in the campaign fund management, mm. you see the way they tackle them. So, mm. parliamentary is not cheap. Presidential is not costly. What is costly is corruption. So, they are costly in Nigeria because of corruption. Mm. So let's have that settled. In a multi, <laughs> in a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and in a nation where South and North dichotomy is very strong, parliamentary system is not good for us. And this is the reason. Parliamentary system is a government where the executive proceeds from the parliament. Parliamentary system is a system of government where all the ministers that must be chosen must come from the parliament. Parliamentary system of government is a government where the people that have the majority will be the ones to form the government. Now, have you anticipated a situation in Nigeria where for example, you have this north-south divide. You have a political party that has its stronghold in the south and some other ones in the north. And then the political party now won the members of the parliament only from the south. I'm just making an example. Yes, and they were able to form the majority. You know what it means? What it means is that that political party alone, all the ministers that will work in that government will all be Southerners. All the members of the legislature, because they have majority, will be Southerners. How will it conduce to our unity? Assuming now you have a party and majority of them are Muslims, and they won the majority in the house. Then all the ministers, even the prime minister, all will be Muslims. And the president will be Muslim. How will it conduce to our unity? How will it conduce to giving people sense of belonging? How will you command national loyalty? Because this is the parliamentary system. But the presidential system, the people 
have direct power to elect who will be the president. Yes. They have the power directly to choose the executive. Mm -hmm. In Britain, England has been consistently producing the prime minister. I want to tell you that it's part of the thing that is making all other people, Scotland, Wales, and Isle, Northern Ireland, to be rescued. Uh -huh. And they are saying they want their own country. Whenever a man who is not from England goes for general election, even if he got the prime ministership from internal arrangement where the prime minister resigned and they say the successor will come from his party, when he goes to general election, he loses because good because of the majority of the power of England vis-a-vis -vis other units. But in America, within about 50 years that the blacks are we are giving the right to even vote, a black man became president. If it was to be from the parliament, there is no way. A black man will have enough people from the parliament to choose him as prime minister. That is what will be happening in Nigeria. If you subscribe to parliamentary system, in Nigeria, it would have been impossible for a man from Bayelsa State that has only eight local governments to become prime minister in Nigeria. Impossible. Remember in the parliamentary system, it's not like the prime minister dies and the deputy prime minister or this becomes prime minister. So, our peculiarities will not go for parliamentary system. We can, a, yeah. we can infuse some of those characteristics of parliamentary system mm -hmm. into our presidential system where we must continually adopt a system we are the executive and the parliament will be voted directly by the people. And they will be check and balance on each other. So that mm. we can have even different parties controlling the parliament and then the executive. As it is done in America. Right. America is practicing presidential system and they have become world power. The people that are practicing parliamentary system have not been able to beat them. So it is not about system. There is no system that is... And you know, in the parliamentary system, you have two heads. Two heads. That is when you will know that when you call one ceremonial head, that that ceremonial head will even be more costly to maintain than the head of government. You have called him that he should go for ceremony. This man will, will turn the state house to... Afro, Afro beat. It, the ceremony there. And when you ask him, you will say it's the ceremonial head. It has happened in Uganda. What I'm telling you, during the time of mm. Mobote, he I had remember. to over... Mm. Good. He had to overthrow the president because the president was taking the shine because he's the head of state. Mm. Mm -hmm. He's the one that can go for any official, that is, for any ceremonial state mm. visit. With the full paraphernalia. Remember, Dr. Oh. Namdaziko, the other person can only go for official visit. He's a oh. walking head. So when you oh. have two heads in Africa that love ceremony, I can tell you the, the two of them will become a problem. So I do not oh. like parliamentary oh. I yeah, want presidential you. system <laughs> where we can so amend for time. I know you, you made your point, fantastic point. And I must confess, I've not even looked at it from the way you did. And that's why you're here, you know, and you have lived up to the expectation. I have two more questions for you. One of it, you've answered for about 90% of it already. I was going to ask you that, taking a look at the current scenarios in the country and uh, what this government under Bala Tinubu has been doing, vis-a-vis -vis the issue in Niger, the coup in Niger, first subsidy, fight against corruption, exchange rate, insurgency, and constitutional amendment. Now, what will, if we're at the Labour Party uh, government in power, what will you have done? You've answered all of, you've spoken about all of them already, except the coup in Niger. So I will just allow you to say what the Labour Party will have gone after 
the Queen, the JR, you know, and do the foreign policy wise. Then the last question I will ask you is this, you know, it's uh, I spoke to OHO, you know, uh, Oseloka area of Basel, and a fantastic guy, you know, he said, based on what he knows, that Peter B won the last general election in Nigeria. I've also spoken to Akio Shitoko, the DJ of the campaign group. He was most emphatic. Both of them with empirical evidence and, you know, seriously indicting I think that Peter will be won the last election. Now, so after you talk about Niji, I want you also to tell our listeners, our viewers, that in your own words, you know, because those who have spoken, and one of the things we do, do we do this thing for posterity, you know, so that the people would know your record and all that. So do you also think it will be won the last election? If yes, how, why? With empirical fact. Over to you, sir. All right. First of all, let's talk about the Niger Republic. Niger Republic. Yes. What happened in Niger Republic was purely a display of incompetence. Mm. I am a student of international law and diplomacy. That's where I did my master's. Now, you don't threaten government. In politics, you say less and do more. Now, this government was saying more when it does not even have the capacity to do less. There was good. There was a queue in Niger Republic. The first question you, you ask yourself, what is the opinion of the people of Niger Republic to that queue? Because when you talk about democracy, you're talking about the government of the people. So if the people have already rejected the government, then what are you threatening to go to war for? Who do you want to fight for? Do you want to fight for Nigeria? Does Nigeria want to occupy Niger Republic? Or do you want to fight for the people of Niger Republic? Now, the people of Niger Republic, they like the government. And then you, a foreign country, you're saying you don't like the government. So when such a thing happens, the first thing you think about is diplomacy. But this government, first of all, said they are giving them seven days or they will be removed by force. Seven days. A government that had Boko Haram since 2009 has not removed Boko Haram. That's how many years now? About 15 years. And then you're giving another country seven days to change their government or be removed. Then this government again went and punished Nigerian people. Eight states from KB. About seven states of the northern Nigeria that has boundary with Niger Republic mm -hmm. from KB to Sokoto to Zamfara to Jigawa to Katsina to Yobe to Boronu. And you immediately clamp down sanctions. Suspended this country from ECOWAS. As at the time this president was doing this, he has not even asked the Senate for approval. So single-handedly he sat down in Aso Villa and maybe thought Republic of Benin, Nigeria is Lagos and started issuing orders that he does not have power. That is incompetence. So what they would have done and what Obi would have done, Obi told you that even all the people in Nigeria that are agitated, he was willing to dialogue with all of them. Obi would have initiated dialogue. And the central theme of the dialogue would have been, if you are taking over this government, military government is no longer allowed in ECOWAS. What is your transition plan? Assuming your people do not like this government, the reason they didn't like this government is because of this government's anti-democratic posture. They have changed their constitution for the man to rule forever. They have rigged the election, so the man was not going to go anywhere. The democracy has already collapsed. So what is your democratic agenda? What is your transition? 
then if they give their own transition program, then you assist them to move towards that democracy. And then you don't need to close the borders because you're suffering your own people. Your economy is suffering and then you are now suffering your own people. So through that dialogue, you will now lead them towards democracy again. Now, these people, they have even said, we are no longer part of ECOWAS. They have joined the other two military governments and they have established a Sahel organization just because of the incompetence of this government. At the end of the day, this government lifted the sanctions. And they still said, no, we are not interested. Because they no longer trust you. Yeah. They are now scared that this you are lifting may be an indirect way for you to achieve that thing you wanted from the beginning. Because you did not hear from them before you levied all those punishments. You can't even condemn a man on head. So this government... Chairman of ECOWAS, chairman of this and that. He just went in and started, you know, blowing trumpet that nobody was dancing. So Obi would have gone through diplomacy first, negotiated his, we know he's a good negotiator, told them why they should come back to democracy and then assist and guide them back to democracy. That's what he would have done. Then on the other issue, which was, let me hear you again, on the second In the last election, yeah, that uh, I've Good. spoken to people that were I've part talked, of your campaign organization so, that said that I've talked about this election. Mm -hmm. For instance, you had three elections in one day. Mm -hmm. And you say one was technically glitched. And they used the same equipment yeah. in organizing them. Yes. Does a machine have the intelligence to choose the election it will glitch on? <laughs> and this technical glitch, you did not tell anybody until you have announced the result. It was later when people were screaming, how come, how come? Go and check it. The word technical glitch came after the final result was announced. So what they just did was when they saw that their preferred candidate was losing. They shut down the machines, fabricated the result, and announced the result, and then started looking for explanation to explain away the result. How can a man lose his own state, lose the national chairman of his party's state, lose the director general of campaign state, Lose the federal capital. You couldn't make 25%. Federal capital and Lagos are the most cosmopolitan. If you want to gauge whether Muslims, Christians, or you supported somebody, watch the performance in Lagos and in Abuja. Mm -hmm. He lost all those things. And suddenly, he won. How? INEC has not produced Pulling unit by pulling unit result to confirm this winning in accordance with section 62 of the Electoral Act. INEC has admitted they did not electronically transmit because they said they had technical glitch. Then where did you get the result? The manual result, as you can see in Lagos, people were physically denied to vote. The presiding officers made it clear that they were told not to transmit the presidential results. They said it openly in Lagos. Some of them say they were told that there is a code they will have. They don't have the code. Some of them say the one they are using, that the National Assembly was going, the presidential election was not going. This was pure manipulation. And if it were in America, everything will be transparent if there is a problem, it is that time that the problem is there that everybody will be seeing it. They did not talk about any problem until when they have assembled their fake results. They are fake because if they are not fake, let them prove it. 
according to how the law said they should prove it. The law said they should provide pulling unit by pulling unit to resolve. In INEC, IREV, their own IREV portal, 18,018 pulling units to resolve. We are not visible. They were not shown. Why were they not shown? Because their preferred candidate lost in all of them. If not, let them show it. A lot of them in rivers. In rivers by the IRF portal. We won in rivers. We won in Benway. We presented the figures in court. They said, no, it came through a subpoena witness. It has come after 21 days. It's not admissible. So I want you to know that everything that happened in that 2023 election was abnormal in the presidential election. They could not explain it to today. What is technical glitch? Who glitched it? Has the person been punished? How was it glitched? At what time was it glitched? Three elections. Then the machine chose one to glitch on. Because it, it must be the machine that chose to glitch on itself. Because, I mean, it was working perfectly in the other two elections. Have you seen ever think... seen? Make such a think... decision in your life? Yeah, you but sorry to interject you once again. Just to now. follow up. Do you think as, the as moral I'm, as I'm body... talking to you, As I'm talking to you now, we're talking through mm. machines. Yes. If there is any glitch, won't you notice it immediately and correct it? Yes, we will. We will. Why my, is it my that your own technical that... glitch was not corrected? I agree with you absolutely. It's shameful though. I mean, like I said, Senegal organized an election within 24 hours or less. We knew who the winner was. India, 1.2 billion people within 24 hours. We know. So, so my follow up really is now. This. Let me just make this point. In Senegal, Please go ahead. Hmm. The constitutional court came out and said the president does not have any discretion. Hmm. He cannot shift the date of election. Election. Mm -hmm. Election must be held. In Nigeria, our court said INEC has discretion mm -hmm. to transmit or not transmit. You see the difference? The mm -hmm. law said INEC shall transmit. Mm -hmm. Section 64 of the Electoral Act is very clear. Section 47, Section 50, very clear. INEC made its own rules and say they shall transmit electronically and use the transmitted results electronically to compare with the manual result before they can produce any election. The court say it's discretionary. Can you imagine what would have happened in Senegal if the Constitutional Court of Senegal had said it is discretionary for the president to choose any date he likes? I would have been on fire by now. And those guys, God, don't, they don't take nonsense. So, <laughs> uh, my follow up really, I was going to say that, mm, considering, because I, I I looked back at the Shagari election of, uh, I think, 1983, and I saw that Shagari won 40, I think, 47% of all the vote casts, you know, which was up to 50% at that time, and that led to a military coup. And this time around, despite all the Ula Balu and the irregularities, you know, and INEX magic and all that, the current president had just 37%, which is not pan Nigeria, clearly, even though with all the, you know, with, with far below even what Shagari had. So my question is that, do you think the president is suffering a moral burden, knowing fully well the irregularities in the election, the way he might, the certificate issues, the drug related problem, you know? Because it does look like, I mean, I've asked people and the likes of me and the rest say, yes, they think that is even part of what is affecting the economy, that the, the foreign direct investment won't come for so, so many reasons. It's not just insurgency, the way the election was conducted, the security and all that. But the question really is, do you think the president is suffering a moral body, you know, right now? These people, they don't have conscience. Mm. So the issue <laughs> of... Uh... A man told you that he wants to be president because that is his life ambition. Did he tell you he wants to do anything good? He told you he wants to be president because that is his own term. If this president or this government has any modicum of conscience, they would have resigned. They would have gone home since. Liz Trust in United Kingdom promised United Kingdom certain things. 
When she came in, she saw that she cannot achieve it based on her promise. She did not say, she did not say, I want to go back on my promise. I want to go back on my idea. The finance minister, first of all, resigned. When it was not enough, within 45 days, she resigned. This government had told you first subsidy is gone and gone forever. They are paying subsidy now. Has he resigned? They have paid. Over a trillion, actually. Good. This government told you that Niger Republic must go. Suspended Niger Republic. Put sanctions. Blocked the borders. Niger Republic, the government, has it changed? He has gone back on all the things he said about the Niger Republic and the sanctions and everything. Has he resigned? This government, the forex exchange, has gone up, down, up, down. Sure, this is the way it's doing. As I'm talking to you. Has he resigned? This government put in employment, uh, expatriate employment levy. It was a, a useless policy which they had to withdraw. Has he resigned? This government made student union, uh, student uh, loan scheme. They made their own law, submitted it, and the National Assembly approved it. And they came back and said it is unimplementable. This is the law they made, though. And they took it back to National Assembly for them to amend it. Have they resigned? That is what I say. This is government of policy flip-flop abroad. No nation on earth that has this kind of government that wouldn't have attracted the resignation of everybody. Have they resigned? And you're saying moral burden. Do they have morality? Do they have... In Lagos, during the election, they brutalized people, women, children. Some people had to be defending their lives. One team I had to bring out dogs to vote in his own country. Yet, they accepted the, so the, the, the people from Southeast were denied their PVC. Yet, they were announced winners and they were laughing. Somebody that has morality, will he accept such a result? I know of a country abroad where a man said no. They did not vote for me. I think in Pakistan or something. I later on discovered that this election was rigged in my favor. <clears throat> the people did not vote for me, and I will not accept it. It happened. In one of these I countries, remember, yeah, in Pakistan, that's true. That's people true. did not vote for you. Why did you accept it? If you have any morality in your heart. Yes. So they don't have when you say moral body. Which moral body? <clears throat> you have to be morally upright for you to have a body. This... When do, say, when do you say Nigeria in 15 years? When do you say Nigeria? That's the final question. When do you say Nigeria in 15 years? You know what? I know it's tricky. Yeah. No. There is something about Nigeria, and I'm going to wax theological. Mm. When Nigeria is going down the drain, something mm. happens to rescue us. Yeah. It happened during June 12th. When it was annulled and people were hopeless, they didn't know what else to go. You couldn't have gone democracy. You couldn't have gone uh, mm -hmm. uh, military. Everything was hopeless. From nowhere, God came in and solved it his own way. <laughs> when IBB came in and did not want to go, after eight years, from nowhere, something happened. He went. So I am only trusting in God now. It's only God that will save us from these incompetent and corrupt leaders. If I tell you that the greatest problem of Nigeria has been inconsistency, yes. policy flip-flop, and now come again to tell you where we will be in 15 years, that means I'm even contradicting my own assertion. Hey, I, I like don't that. know where we will be in the next 15 years. I don't know. <laughs> Because of the consistency over and over and over Absolutely. again. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you know Thank you. that one helped me. But Thank for you. me, I, I don't know. I, I don't wish know. I did. I wish I you did. Can, you I can see how even the prophets, all their policies, Man. the inconsistency in Nigeria has even made all prophets as if they don't Man. know what they are prophesying. Nigeria has empowered everybody. 
Nobody gets you know, the vaccine. People, people who are claiming that God told them. Really? Then you can imagine me. For me. <laughs> that is not claiming to be a prophet. And you're asking me where we'll be in the next 15 years. My answer is, I don't know. So if you know, help me. Honestly, I don't. Thank you, Kenneth Okoko. Fantastic. You live up to the billing. We're not surprised. The world loved this. Atlanta discussed love. We're not going to leave you alone. We're going to bring you back again. You are you are just uh, a mobile encyclopedia. You always say true to power. Because here at Atlanta Discuss, we embrace off a set of humanity we, you know we just give a voice to the unheard we balance the information equation we search and discuss the facts wherever i lead combine the best of human race to get the best out of mankind serve as a bridge between the developing and the developer we embrace it sport health history and even faith based issues we do not shy away from the fact that's why today we brought kenneth okoko kenneth okoko thank you for coming to atlanta discuss thank you so so much thank you for creating time amidst your very very busy schedule and it's weekend you have to rest and all that thank you so much and to our people in the seven continent australia europe africa wherever you may be thank you for your loyalty next week friday we're going to come to you again with another juicy and very sensitive topic Take care. God bless you all. It's a wrap. Bye.